Hi, this is Sarah O'Dell, author of an upcoming book on the medical inkling, Dr. Havard. You're listening to Pints with Jack. Myths communicate truth about a reality that reaches beyond our usual experience. A compass for deep heaven, navigating the C.S. Lewis Ransom Trilogy. Season 6, Episode 6. A compass for deep heaven, after hours with Dr. Diana Glyer. Welcome, everyone. Here on Pints with Jack, we're working our way through the works of C.S. Lewis. As we mentioned at the start of the month, from time to time, we'll be consulting with experts about the book, which we're reading this season, the first in the Ransom Trilogy, Out of the Silent Planet. And today, we're delighted to have Dr. Diana Glyer return to the show once again to discuss a book she edited on the subject in 2021. And today's opening quotation about truth and myth came from her book, A Compass for Deep Heaven. And we selected these, uh, particularly this quote, because these ideas are really, the ideas that are going to come across in the Ransom Trilogy are really powerful. And we want to unpack some of those and give you a bit of a teaser of that that she, uh, through this book, uh, demonstrates to us. And so we'll have a conversation on that here today. But first, let me introduce our guest. Dr. Diana Pavlik Glyer is an award winning writer who has spent more than 40 years combing through archives and studying old manuscripts and has read every single word of every single inkling. Her scholarship, her teaching, and her works as an artist all circle back to one common theme creativity thrives in community. She has been on this show several times, and she's returning once again to speak to us about Out of the Silent Planet and a book which she edited in 2021, A Compass for Deep Heaven, Navigating the C.S. Lewis Ransom Trilogy. Dr. Diana Glyer, welcome back to Pints with Jack. It's a joy to join you today. I'm so excited about our conversation. Well, I and for me, it's uh, any time we're in the same room is uh, a time for me to learn and to delight. Uh, I was so thrilled earlier this summer to get so much time with you, especially during the first week of our pilgrimage. And um, uh, time with you is one of the highlights of my life. I was looking back at the pictures of um, of the Westminster Abbey nine years ago today and remember waving at you across the transept and a couple of pictures together. And so thank you for joining us as we uh, set out uh, set out in our own spacecraft uh, towards an unknown world. Sounds wonderful. Thank you uh, so much, Andrew. Well, in two, I didn't really realize this, but in inspiration or in the motivation of that common theme, creativity thrives in community. This, Andrew, might be the first ever guest after hours we've done with two hosts, yeah. you and I at the same time. <laughs> and so I'm excited to see the dynamic and where this goes. Usually it's just one of us interviewing an interview an, uh, individual. Diana and listeners, uh, yeah, yeah, a couple of years ago, um, we stopped doing as many of the three of us, and so we had various um, various combinations, and Matt and I always enjoyed our time together, um, but we never really have done an after hours like that. And Diana, the reason that it's both of us is David gave us a list of the future guests, and Matt and I had a grudge match fight over <laughs> who would be able to interview you, and obviously I won. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I, uh, you guys may be familiar with an article that I wrote called The Algebra of Friendship. And it goes yeah. back to that idea that Lewis borrows from Charles Lamb, that different people draw out different dimensions or aspects of ourselves. And that the more, the merrier, literally, because we see more of one another when there are more people around to draw out these various aspects of ourselves. So I don't want to get too crowded in here, but uh, I think that this will be a fantastic <laughs> chance to bounce some ideas back and forth. Well, and last last season, we talked about the four loves and that poignant quote um, of Lewis's, now that Charles is gone, I don't have more of Ronald, I actually have less of him, mm -hmm. speaking of Charles Williams and, and J.R.R. Tolkien. So I'm, I'm glad it's the three of us here. Well, before we dive in, Diana, what have you been up to since the last time you're on Pints with Jack? I want to say that was you and I maybe a year and a half ago, potentially. 
Yeah, uh, I, it has been a very uh, busy and happy season for me. Lots of new projects underway, lots of fun things. I'll be returning my full attention to the study of the Inklings in a few months, and i um, excited to announce later more about that particular project. But in the meantime, I, I do have a new book that just released this week. So oh, we're no here in November, and uh, Journey Back Again, Reasons to Revisit Middle Earth is a collection of essays about uh, Tolkien's Lord of the Rings. And that just was released this week. And I'm excited about that book because already I'm hearing from people who have never read Lord of the Rings and thought, well, maybe I need to actually read the book, not just the movies. And God, no, not another season of Rings of Power. <laughs> uh, but maybe I just need to go back to Tolkien, right? Go back to the, the, the main text, this master work, and find out what does Tolkien have to say himself? And how does he craft this incredible sub creation world. And so these are essays that one reviewer described as a book club with a group of intelligent friends you didn't know you had. And I love that description because Journey Back Again is not a book that's trying to impress or add to the scholarly conversation. It really is people who love the Lord of the Rings talking about various things that they noticed and that other people might have missed. So it's got mm. the best quality of that sitting around with friends. Did you see this? Oh, I noticed that. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's supposed to be uh, just really a warm and invitational kind of text to get people back into the Lord of the Rings. So I'm excited about that and its potential. I love that you've done that. And to me, it kind of echoes a couple of different things. Um, Tom Shippey, in his book, uh, Tolkien, the author of the century, look at you ostentatiously drinking from your water bottle with our pints with Jack sticker on it. <laughs> Listeners, <laughs> you should see it. Um, love Tom Shippey saying, essentially, who reads Ulysses again for fun? Yet, <laughs> the Lord of the Rings draws people back again and again and again with increasing enjoyment. And of course, as Jack said, when one has read a book, I find there's nothing so nice as discussing it with someone else who's read it, even though it tends to produce rather fierce arguments or because it does. And so I'm so grateful that you have this, uh, have this book out there for folks to kind of find their own way in. And is that going to be similar when you, you mentioned collection of essays, similar to the book actually we're talking about today, A, a Compass for Deep Heaven, where it's, it's essays from different individuals on the topic? Yes, it is. Uh, they have similar, um, they come from a, a similar place. In both cases, I'm an editor uh, more than an author. And I've had the privilege in both cases to work with a group of young scholars who are very, very enthusiastic about the topic. And both of them began as projects in the Honors College at Azusa Pacific University. Okay. And so then with, with the one that we're going to be discussing today, A Compass for Deep Heaven, where was the original inspiration for that? So I, that was written last year and, and how does that come about? And you said it was from the Honors College and, and where does the, the inspiration for the origin of this book come from? Yeah, I'm really privileged to teach in the Honors College at Azusa Pacific in California. And we do something that I think is really remarkable for our senior capstone project. So the Honors College has a great works approach, which means that we read a lot of things, but we read them rather quickly, just like most of the great works programs or classics programs. You're reading pretty fast in order to really start to grapple with the best that has ever been written and thought. And so our dean decided to help students to kind of slow down and rather than trying to master a work, to allow one work to really master them. And so our seniors spend a full year uh, from spring to spring reading a book, studying it with a tutor in a small group of usually eight to 10 students, and then writing a book about that book together. And so both A Compass for Deep Heaven and Journey Back Again started as one of these senior projects where students started over the summer, reading the book together and discussing it through online forums, then getting together in the fall to discuss the work more in depth, to read and reread each section of it, to talk together about what might meet a need in terms of doing some writing about the book. And, and what's your hope when you guys were putting this together? Your, your 
for a new reader like myself as a new reader about two weeks ago <laughs> in preparation <laughs> for this interview reading this for someone to take away from this so they pick this up for the first time and your desire would be when they put this down at the end boom yeah um so a compass for deep heaven came about in a little bit of a different way than some of these books in that when my students finished their summer reading and we got deep into our our fall reading they kept asking questions why is this in here what is what is the reference here lewis seems to be alluding to something or he's name dropping and i just don't understand actually what he's doing so we spent a lot of time talking about these different ideas and these different concepts and after we'd done this for a little bit more than a month, my students said, I wish I had known all of this before I started reading. Mm -hmm. I would have read it differently if I'd known a little bit more about Lewis's um, relationship with the world wars or Lewis's background in science fiction or Lewis's characterization of himself as someone who is a medieval person, someone who looks at the world through a medieval lens. And the students said, I feel like I lost a lot and I mm -hmm. wish that someone had helped me with the, the backdrops and the mm -hmm. building blocks of mm -hmm. the uh, science fiction trilogy. And that was our first attempt, right? When we wrote our first draft of the book that became A Compass for Deep Heaven is asking what are these backdrops and building blocks? So, so Matt, if I had to explain it, I would explain it like this. I think C.S. Lewis is undoubtedly really, really smart and really, really well read, <laughs> but that's not the problem. The problem is that Lewis keeps on extending to us a compliment that we don't deserve. And that's the compliment that he thinks we're as smart and as well read I as, can we, as he is. And so... Um, so when we're reading Lewis, every now and then, readers get that sense that they know there's something going on, but mm -hmm. they're not really sure. It's like they're not in on the joke or they're not quite catching the reference. And so you end up feeling kind of dumb and maybe a little bit left out. At least I do, right, when I read without this expansive background. So that's what my students were experiencing. I wish I had known this before I had started to read Out of the Silent Planet, because Lewis is constantly riffing off of other authors, mm -hmm. other genres, other historical events, and other assumptions, theological and philosophical. And my students said, I just didn't catch the reference. I felt like an outsider. So mm. to answer your wonderful question more directly, when people read A Compass for Deep Heaven, what I hope they'll get is a sense of being having a door flung open and being invited inside to mm. the kinds of things mm. that Lewis is using as the fundamental building blocks as he begins working on this science fiction series. And, and Andrew, I know you have a, a follow-up question, but I'll quickly just say, as a person that is probably the target audience, the least well-read <laughs> individual in this <laughs> conversation here. I had read the book um, about a month before, and then I read yours a couple weeks ago. And listeners, I can second everything uh, Diana just said, because I probably tripled the amount I could have gotten from it the first mm -hmm. reading had I read this beforehand. I was like, mm -hmm. oh my goodness, I can see that. I missed that the first time around. And so I will obviously be re reading this as we now go along through the ep the uh, season again, the book. And so I can't wait to read it a second time now with this new knowledge. So listeners, mm -hmm. you're hearing this in the very beginning of, of the season. And so I would highly recommend getting this book. And the nature of the essay format too means you can you can pick it up and put it down mm -hmm. and pick it up and put it back down. And so you can read a few of them and that will already give you a, a leg up. And then maybe you're busy for a couple of weeks and read again. So it's, it's the perfect book to just to be doing right now. Um, I, I would I would add to that. I love that description of it. You're, you're exact. That's exactly what we're hoping for. I might mention that one of our early reviewers was very negative about the book because they said it wasn't lofty enough. It wasn't scholarly enough, mm -hmm. and it didn't add any new substantial insight to our understanding of um, of Lewis. 
And I was like, you know, that really wasn't the goal, right? Yeah. This isn't a you book. read it correctly. This <laughs> we is, weren't trying to do that. <laughs> this isn't a book for scholars who are looking for the latest interpretation or the newest like little factoid or bit of insight. I love books like that. I write books like that. I appreciate books like that. This is a book for readers, readers mm. who feel like they've been flung into the deep end of the pool. And they really, really want someone to kind of throw them a life preserver or hand them a compass as they're journeying through the space trilogy that says, here, let me help you get your bearings a little bit. Let me help you appreciate what you're seeing as you journey through. Well, if not in the deep end of the pool, maybe lost in space. Right? <laughs> <laughs> oh, I think that... I think that the, that approach is so excellent because it brings about this kind of bifurcation I see often at C.S. Lewis conferences where people's immediate disclaimer is, oh, I'm not a scholar oh, yeah, or yeah. I haven't read that much Lewis. Yes. And they've read enough Lewis to allow them to buy a plane ticket and pay a, you know, a fee to come across the ocean and attend a conference about Lewis, but they don't feel like they have read enough Lewis, which is actually how I started my C.S. Lewis 101s. I try to always press back with that marvelous French word, amateur. Yes. Because an amateur is a lover. And we are all amateurs when it comes to Lewis, and Lewis himself is the ultimate amateur. He loves other books and he loves other periods and he introduces them to us gleefully. Diana, you'll remember this incident from one of the biographies or somewhere, the letters perhaps, um, where he finishes a lecture and he's walking somewhere with another professor and Lewis continues talking about the subject, right? Medieval literature, whatever. And and the, his colleague, his professional colleague says effectively, good God, man, the bell rang. Why are you still nattering on about that? But Lewis loved the topic and wanted to live in that situation. And the scholars that I know, um, I think that it's categorized by love, right? It's mm -hmm. a categorized by a love for Lewis. And then he opens so many doors to us that we go traipsing along and we find new things to love. And that love also describes what happens when the best Lewis scholars get together. It's more exulting in something that we love. And so to have this book by people who love Lewis about a book that they love, which Lewis is writing out of love, I think is just such a, an important contribution. Thank you. Thank you. That's exactly right. Thank you so much. I did have a question as we go into myth, and this is something that I would love to get your take on because part of what I try to do when I contextualize the Ransom books for somebody who's never read them is I say, you know, Lewis wasn't that interested in the technology or even the geography or astrology or astronomy of the space travel. He wasn't so much interested in the science, uh, but one of the early draws for him were the spiritual ramifications of space travel. And so I'd love for you to open with a comment a little bit about David Lindsay and Voyage to Arcturus and what he picked up from there. And and for me, the crystallizing moment is when Hyoi, this Martian creature, uh, Ransom feels an obligation to tell him about, about Christ. And Hyoi begins to catechize Ransom. Mm -hmm. Hyoi knows more about the, the, the interstellar nature of God than even Ransom does. And so it's these spiritual ramifications that I think Lewis is primarily interested in. What do you think about that? Well, the idea of myth is absolutely key to understanding, particularly out of the silent planet, but really all three of the science fiction books. And I think that, that needs to, you need to go back to the origin right, of Out of the Silent Planet, which was a barroom bet, a wager, uh, as it's called. And so you have to picture Lewis and Tolkien sitting in a pub, and maybe they've had a pint, uh, or maybe two or three, and um, Lewis throws back his head and says, you know what, there's a problem, Tollers, there aren't enough of the kinds of books we like to read, we'll have to write them ourselves. And 
this is an absolutely and utterly absurd statement, right? It's a bunch, it's like, it's like a bunch of, um, you know, 15 year old Star Wars fans sitting around saying there aren't any good Star Wars movies coming out. We need to make one (laughs) ourselves on our iPhones. I mean, it's just, it's just absurd. Neither Lewis uh, nor Tolkien had written a a novel per se at that time. They were both uh, unknown academics and they're sitting around saying, we're going to write the next uh, best-selling thriller, which is how they perceived it. And so they continue to talk and it was like, what do we want to write? What is missing? And I can really relate to this because this was my experience too, as a high schooler, uh, reading every science fiction book I could get my hands on, the ones I loved best were the ones that told me something that felt true about human experience. In other words, I didn't like reading just because there was a thrilling adventure. I wanted there to be another layer where I felt I was getting insights. And that's one of the things that happens, I think, in the best of science fiction, is it tells us something about the human condition, what it means to be human, what happens to our humanity when we are put into new circumstances or new situations. And that's the kind of thing that Lewis had seen in Lindsay's book, a book that communicated not only a great story, because you have to have that for starters, right? But underneath that, that revealed, unveiled something important about what it means to be human, and perhaps even broader, something that reveals truth. So English teachers uh, like me, When we're teaching introduction to literature classes and we talk about literature, we talk about myth in a way that's very different from the way that, say, the average person uses the word in journalistic terms, right? So if you say, oh, that politician, he made a bunch of promises, but it was all a myth, we mean a lie, right? We mean something that is um, absolutely untrue. And that's not how literary folks use the idea of myth. We define a myth as something that reveals truth through narrative rather than a propositional statement or something that captures the deepest truth of a culture through Mm -hmm. stories. Mm -hmm. And so that's what Tolkien and Lewis were sitting down and setting out to write was a myth, something that would tell something true about the nature of reality, even though the events weren't actually real. And it was this challenge, right, that they set off uh, to to write those those novels that night. Tolkien started writing a book that ended up um, uh, called The Lost Road, and he never finished it. Like most of what he started, (laughs) he didn't finish it. He got a few chapters into it. But later, Tolkien said it was that project that gave him the seed bed for the Lord of the Rings. And so it was productive, even though he didn't finish the particular book. I picture Lewis going home from that barroom bet, feeling a little bit put out that he'd put himself in a situation where he has to sit down and write a novel. And you you see that, I think, in the very beginning of the story, Mm. where he decides to I think maybe plot revenge on his good friend Tolkien. And he opens the story with a pedestrian, capital P pedestrian, unnamed pedestrian, who just happens to be a philologist, as Tolkien was, and who's on a walking tour and who gets lost and who doesn't have the good sense to know how to find a place to stay or a bed for the night or a warm meal. And I think he starts the story with this sort of revenge in mind. He's going to take Tolkien, fictionalize him, and then get him lost, kidnapped, (laughs) and taken to Mars. Uh, Maybe that's not true, but that's how I read the beginning chapters. But then I think... Lewis gets enchanted with this new location and begins to try to reveal to us something much deeper and truer about what is the best of humanity. How can people encounter the other in a way that's not only charitable, but but humble and um, and full of grace? Mm-hmm. So many other themes start to emerge as I think Lewis starts his story in a creaky, uncertain way and then finds his footing even as Ransom begins to explore the planet of Malacandra. Hmm. Piggybacking off this idea of myth and the power that it can reveal through narrative these truths. I love the way that you phrase that and thanks for describing that so beautifully. 
I used to be a person that would rather just hear the truth. Mm. Until probably I actually encountered Lewis, uh, ironically. I, I was always like, oh, I just want to read a, a, tr- a book that's packed with a whole bunch of truth that lays it out, convinces me. I'm like, boom, this is beautiful. And so the concept of reading some myth or fiction book that that has truth weaved within it was very foreign to me. And it just felt honestly inefficient. And <laughs> I'm curious what you would say of of why... To someone like that, who's sitting here on the other side of the the uh, this recording and listening to this, is like, I would just rather give me give me his mere Christianity. <laughs> Let him lay this all out and punch me in the face with this stuff. You know, the the reason and the the beauty of why this can be a different way of presenting it and the power of presenting it this way. And as you consider your answer, I want to warn you, Diana, that Matt thinks that he doesn't like poetry. <laughs> <laughs> Throw me under he the keeps, bus here, Andrew. He, oh, dude, that wasn't throwing you under the bus. That was pausing and opening the doors and inviting you to leave. <laughs> <laughs> um, we keep giving him these great poems, and he's like, yeah, I kind of like that one. I still hate poetry, but I kind of like that one. Oh, I like that one, too. Along those lines, I wonder if it's um, within the realm of your answer to kind of help us make sense of this famous quote that reason is the natural organ of truth. But imagination is the organ of meaning. Imagination producing new metaphors or revivifying old is not the cause of truth, but its condition. So I don't well, know. Uh, we- Andrew, I've known you long enough to know that if you're going to throw a quote out, you already know what you want to say about it. So I'm going to no, make a little bit I of don't. space for you to I respond don't. to that. I, I don't. And then I, I will don't. talk about what, why I think that both narrative and propositional statements are important, but you first. No, I, I like don't. It. I really, I like it, Andrew. that one always kind of puts me in a cul-de-sac, um, except to say that till we have faces is probably the natural organ of both. <laughs> 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 we have a drinking game on this show where our listeners and our co-hosts, um, and it's been a while since they've had a drink, so I thought I'd throw that in. No, I really honestly uh, have uh, want to hear your opinion, because I still have trouble making sense of that. Well, listeners, you just saw something very, very unusual. You saw Andrew refuse to pick up the mic and run with it. <laughs> yes, that is so true. That is so true. I tried. That was pretty good bait, too, and you didn't yeah, take it. <laughs> Listen, why why play with minnows when you've got the great white on the hook? Come on, tell us. What's, oh gosh. Tell us hey, that. so I'm gonna I'm gonna go back to Matt's question, sure. <laughs> which he asked, I think, an hour and a half ago, which is <laughs> Why not just give a list of propositional statements? And mm-hmm. um, what I would do, what I would say to that, uh, simply enough, is that it is much to our benefit that Lewis does both. That there are propositional arguments that are absolutely rock hard and crystal clear. There is poetry and song, and then there's also wonderful storytelling, and. I think that different people find one or the other of these languages more their native tongue. And so Lewis, understanding this and thinking about the people to whom he is writing, uh, does this wonderful variety of approaches. And then if you're paying attention, he has uh, maybe a primary mode but he has the other ones tucked inside. So even when he's arguing in mere Christianity, there are stories and metaphors and analogies that are sprinkled through that bring these things to life. Even in Out of the Silent Planet, there's poetry. Poetry itself is talked about and celebrated, but the language of Out of the Silent Planet is is remarkable. And one of the reasons that I fell in love with this book at the, at the start, if I could just read the beginning of chapter one, listen yeah. to the poetry of the language, right? It starts out like this, very unlike an H.G. Wells or Jules Verne novel. Lewis starts this way. The last drops of the thunder shower had hardly ceased falling when the pedestrian stuffed his map into his pocket, settled his pack more comfortably on his tired shoulders and stepped out from the shelter of a large chestnut tree into the middle of the road. A violent yellow sunset was pouring through a rift in the clouds to westward, but straight ahead over the hills, 
The sky was the color of dark slate. Every tree and blade of grass was dripping, and the road shone like a river. Hmm. Poetry. It's poetry Hmm. right from the start. And so Lewis used all these different modes. Lewis tucked the um, qualities of each in everything that he wrote. But Matt, what I would also point out to you is so does scripture. Mm. Holy scripture incorporates Mm. parables, but also 10 commandments, but also Psalms that express not only our highest joys, but our deepest laments. Mm. And so we are already given an example of what glorious communication looks like. It functions in all of these different ways and the very best of it intertwines all three. Mm. Mm. Well said. (laughs) You know, that reminds me of that marvelous lecture we heard, I think on a Saturday morning uh, in Oxford from Father Michael Ward, who gave me this, it gave us all this kind of helpful thought category. Listeners, if you don't know Lewis's essay, Meditation in a Tool Shed, it's immediate and vital reading. Um, our friend uh, Bruce L. Edwards of Blessed Memory um, said that he started every class with that essay. And I know that Bruce was your mentor for yes. your graduate work and became a, a, a dear friend through the years. But that you can look at a thing or along a thing and then, but then put on the board the ats versus along. So abolition of man is the at and that hideous strength is the along or... Four loves is the at until we have faces is the along. Early prose joy, the at, surprised by joy. So, and that thought category. But of course, as you say, the two kinds of things, the imaginative and the rational, continue to intersect because he's such a cohesive writer. Mm. But your um, your analogy about scripture is invaluable. And that's, Uh I'm, I'm writing that down. That's pretty much the nail in the coffin, too. I mean, you can't argue <laughs> against that. I mean, that, that's it. <laughs> you can, but you'll probably go to hell. <laughs> We've talked a little bit about myth, but I wonder if we could talk just a couple of um, minutes about some of the myths that I think are embedded in Out of the Silent Planet. What are these truths I would love to. that Lewis is communicating to us? Uh, as we read it, and what are some things that people who are reading it for the first time or people who are rereading it for the 10th time might be alert to as they go back and read together with you over this next uh, month? And one of them, I would say, one propositional statement is that the individual is of infinite importance. And we see that throughout, we see that in so many ways, but when we compare the worth or the value of an individual soul to something like progress or Mm -hmm. wealth or even intellect or intellectual gains uh, or technological gains, again and again, Out of the Silent Planet points out to us that each individual soul is incredibly valuable. And I think it does it in a way that's really, um, at some points, chilling it's sometimes poignant, but I think that in a way, and I, I just thought about this as I was rereading yesterday, uh, rereading Out of the Silent Planet, I think that the very best of Lewis's sermon, The Weight of Glory, is mm-hmm. already hidden here in Out mm-hmm. of the Silent Planet. Those ideas that there are no ordinary people, and then our invitation uh, to to love and serve one another in a profound way. I think it's in Out of the Silent Planet, and I think it's one of the most important ideas uh, that is in there. And Out of the Sil- Silent Planet predates Weight of Glory. And so this idea, and of course the encounter that gets Lewis to Mars is mercy for Harry. That's right. right. Mercy for this feeble-minded person and mercy for the mother, and then mercy for Hyoi. Right. Yes. It's this. Uh, yeah. So good. Oh. And one other one other myth, mythological idea that I think is really important that I think Lewis can tell in a story better than he can tell any other way is the idea that the supernatural world exists side by side with the natural world. Mm-hmm. And every now and then, if we have eyes to see, we can catch a glimpse of it. But we have to be paying attention. And as Andrew mentioned earlier, we also have to be open to beauty and to love 
in order to see. And so when Ransom arrives on Malacandra, he observes the first thing he learned about Malacandra was that it was beautiful. And once he was open to the beauty of it, then he was able to open to the truth of it. And I think that that goes back to the idea of myth itself. You know, it's it's astounding because um, when Ransom gets there, he's so self-consumed and self-absorbed. And he's in this kind of miasma. He's in this kind of feverish thing. And he begins to, it's only when he begins to see beyond himself right? That he begins to learn language and see that there might be something else going on. And Paul Ford, uh, another mutual friend, uh, has, an, has an entry in his um, companion to Narnia for the first time, which usually signifies a spiritual sea change. Edmund, for the first time, begins to think of someone else, or Eustace, for the first time, begins to feel lonely. And we have several instances of that phrase in the early chapters of Out of the Silent Planet for the first time. And it's when he gets beyond himself and begins to be in relationship to somebody else who is not, as Lewis famously said, you know, like most aliens, like we see most aliens portrayed, he's not somebody to be dominated or somebody who's a ter- ter- you know, terrifying monster, but he's another now. He's another, he's another soul. Um, it's when he begins to reach out and get over himself that his eyes begin to open, which is what we see with Lucy and everybody else. Mm-hmm. Exactly right. Beautifully said. Well done. I want to I want to go slightly deeper into one of the concepts you just brought up uh, when you were when you were talking about the myths that stick out to you, and I loved that one on the the value of the individual. That, that very first one you had mentioned because. The, the essay that you have in your book on scientism really hit me. And I love that Lewis took scientism progress, this idea to the extreme of what it can mean for the individual. And you see this in Out of the Silent Planet, what you just mentioned, it almost devalues the individual and some extreme consequences can come from that for the sake of progress, for the sake of science. So we, we saw that side and you mentioned that beautifully. What in Out of the Silent Planet does Lewis propose as the cure to that? So, okay, if 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 that's not the way to think about things as pro- progress is the ultimate good, the individual, mankind is more important than man. That was something that stuck out to me when I was reading that essay. And so we can, we can do things in the name of mankind rather than uh, for the sake of man. What would be the cure that we see in Out of the Silent Planet as, as a reader is reading that? I think that chapter is one of the most important chapters because I think that people can mistakenly assume that Lewis is anti-science and he's not, not in any way, shape or form. It wasn't his first love, you know, he, um, he's a literary guy, but he really did appreciate science for what science has to offer. What he's warning us about is scientism, which is taking science as if it is the only Uh, lens through which we can see the entirety of reality. And that's the abuse of science, not the use of science. Mm -hmm. So science used accurately is when science is used as a tool to view the things for which science is helpful. But theology and philosophy and, yes, Andrew, even poetry (laughs) <laughs> are the proper lens to see other aspects of the very, very large and magnificent universe within which we live. You don't use science for that. Um, so what he's looking at is he wants science in its proper place, mm-hmm. and he appreciates and admires it as a way of examining certain kinds of questions. But there are other questions, mm-hmm. and there are other aspects of our human life and of the universe within which we live that need a different approach. Uh, and, and you can think about the various disciplines that you might study at college, each one as a different kind of lens or approach or tool, as it were, to be able to examine some of these larger questions. So the proper response to scientism 
is to respect science for the things that it has mm -hmm. to offer, mm -hmm. but to expand the range of questions and the different kinds of inquiry that are available to us and to use the proper means of inquiry mm -hmm. to ask and answer the right kinds of questions. Well, and we find that in the very first chapter of Screwtape, right? Screwtape wants mm -hmm. his patient to avoid reading the hard sciences. Um, Francis Collins, in terms of talking of the question, says that science is very good at the hows and not so good at the whys yeah. because that's not what it's designed to do. Um, and then the other piece that I just love about that is that Lewis, as you said, Diana, is, is a literary guy, but he reads more science than any human, humanities person that I know and is able to distinguish. And in his essay about um, psychoanalysis, he clearly has read Freud. And Freud is very helpful, he says. Freudianism is a train wreck. Yeah. And so that's one of the things that Lewis continues to pull us to do, like, like we learned in, in Four Loves, to define and describe. So most people who are talking about science, um, especially blithely, are often quoting the headlines and haven't really you know, read the actual science. And if so, maybe the, just the science textbooks, when is the last time you actually read some Einstein? Let's talk about that. And so that's part of where classical education, uh, I think, helps us out. And Lewis read widely, uh, even though he didn't have to, in order to, to know these things, and I think serves as a great model for that. He wasn't afraid to read things that disagreed with his worldview. And he wasn't intimidated by that process. Sometimes we are afraid of being exposed to ideas that are foreign to us. And he never was. And I think that that's part of the reason that his intellect was constantly sharpened by the things he encountered, by the new ideas that he was willing to consider and mm -hmm. then either accept, reject, or modify. I must see with other eyes, you know, the, exactly. the perspective of other writers, even invented worlds are not enough um, for me and that kind of humility to, and, you know, I understand the, the need to keep children safe in their reading and to help guide them. But I'm always struck when that spirit of terror overtakes some well-meaning um, parents that Lewis read everything he could to get away from Christianity but he read it in such a way that it led him to Christianity. And that's, I think, one of the overarching things about Lewis in this book and all others. He's an evangelist for excellent reading, yes. right? Mm -hmm. and, and it helps us along those lines. Well, and you know, something that stuck out to me, one final thing on the, the scientism side of things, you see, I, I loved in Out of Science Plant, this was actually one of the things that stuck out to me before reading your book when I mentioned that there was some stuff that did and then there's a lot that was illuminated on was um, you see the dichotomy between ransom and the local's way of living in Weston and, and is it divine or divine, 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 divine and divine. And that was Lewis created such a distinction between that of using creation versus like being a part of it. And I, and I think of the, the example of uh when they're is it sharks that they're they, they have that relationship with that like almost like not sharks but that's what i pictured of it like the creatures <laughs> in the right. waters and no, not yes right. and yes and they're they're uh there's like a healthy relationship with it that they they re have a respect for it mm -hmm. but they know they can if they win that battle they can use that for food but they might lose it too and that's okay and death is okay and it was just mm -hmm. a really beautiful way of living like i'm looking at uh, when i was reading it and this was again before really having a ton of context or knowledge on the 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 series i was like man i wish i just had this healthy relationship with with um creation uh, more or less mm -hmm. and so that really stuck out to me as just a beautiful dichotomy that i i loved in the book but not only a healthy relationship like in in that way but also with danger and with difficulty mm -hmm which are mm -hmm. things that we think the ideal life would be completely void of those things, of sorrow mm -hmm. and loss. And yet mm -hmm. we see embodied in this culture uh, a kind of um, embracing and willingness to get the, the best out of all of it, uh, mm -hmm. no matter what, even if it isn't what we might prefer. And that posture toward our circumstances is one that we learn, I think, 
to go back to our earlier conversation, we learn by example, we learn by seeing how Hoy and the others interact and respond with these realities more than we would if someone were to say, okay, when you are faced with a dangerous creature, here are the four <laughs> steps that you should follow. We enter into the narrative, to the story, to the example. And I think that we are uh, challenged and even encouraged by it, don't you? I was. Well, question. And, and for me, I remember reading these books in my mid-20s, not long after... Um, not long after Keggy introduced me to Lewis and he started to save my adult faith and develop my intellectual life and teach me how to read. And I remember it was in my 20s when reading Out of the Silent Planet and Paralandra that those ideas uh, that later I understand theologically are the, are the practical devotional application of the the Pauline statements to rejoice in the Lord always and to give thanks in all circumstances and and Hyoy's willingness to go face death and to take whatever Malal Dill sends to me he says and then you know then to Tenedril when in Paralandra shall I not receive the next wave shall I not take whatever it is that the Lord sends me even if it's a dire or difficult thing and. To me, that sense of not false Pollyanna-ish optimism, but that sense of faith that allows me to deliberately rejoice in the depth of bad circumstance, I didn't understand until we were discussing today that that was seeded and, and fostered and grown when I read these books about how to believe in the Lord and how to receive whatever Melodil, blessed be he, might send to us. And and that's the, and Lewis worms that in. I didn't even know that in that story he was giving me a theological theme that I preach about all the time now. So, yeah, what a gift! Past watchful dragons. <laughs> yes, that's exactly right. Yes. Well, let's turn to one final part that I'd love to have a, uh, get your thoughts on. I really loved in your book the essay on medievalism, and. The reason it stuck out to me is I feel like people today could use the exact same lesson, particularly this focus on we, we pretty much have a materialism, a scientism today. Progress is super important and it's led to anxiety, depression. And he actually talks about medieval, medievalism, kind of the semi-return was the word I put in, in quotations to that way of thinking can be an antidote to the anxieties of uh, the current times Now he was talking about then, but I think they apply today. So I'm curious first, you know, what he means by this proposed semi-return to a medieval uh, times and how that can benefit us today. So when, when Lewis is thinking about medieval times, he's not thinking about the um, knights on horseback jousting in the arenas. <laughs> He's thinking about something else. He's thinking about a medieval worldview. And of course, he described himself as one who held a medieval worldview. And so he's speaking in a way as a native, as someone who kind of looks at the world in this way. And there are a number of ways in which his medievalism is evident in the science fiction trilogy. I think uh one big part of that, actually a big part of a Compass for Deep Heaven is talking about medieval themes, not only what it means to have a medieval worldview, but also the importance of the King Arthur legends, mm -hmm. which are so important to understanding what um, Lewis is doing, particularly in that hideous strength. And so I found those chapters personally to be really enriching because of the hmm. details that uh, Daniel, who wrote about Arthurian legend, goes into and the way that he unpacks that and shows the close connection, particularly if anybody, anybody anywhere has ever had trouble with that hideous strength. Uh, those chapters I thought were particularly useful for reading that book. But anyway, what is it about a medieval point of view that's helpful? One of them is an idea that's hard for us in contemporary times, and that's the value of hierarchy or order. A uh, medieval worldview was a very ordered way of looking at the world. And there wasn't a tension in seeing things in their proper relationship to one another. When we think of ideas like hierarchy or we think of leadership or we think of submission, 
all of those kinds of terms, that whole class and category of terms has a negative uh, kind of connotation for most of us. But for Lewis, it had a very positive connotation. Things rightly ordered in the Aristotelian sense, right? They were ordered uh, and in, in proper relation to one another. And that gives a sense of peace. It gives an, um, a clarity about what our role is and what our task is. Each of us finding our place in the universe and feeling safe and secure and having great clarity about those uh, ideas. And then it goes back also to this other idea that I mentioned about the reality of the supernatural world side by side with the natural world, that these things were not, as we tend to think of them, compartmentalized. So for many Christians today, we think about, okay, in the morning, I do my 15-minute morning prayer, and then on Sunday morning, I go to mass or I go to church. And that's my church part of my week. And then I have the rest of the week that I divide into my work part and my family part and so on and so on. And we tend to live compartmentalized lives. And a medieval mindset absolutely refuses to do that and sees particularly that stream of the supernatural as, as uh, under underneath and around um, everything that we do, everything that we think and every aspect of our life. And that kind of an integrated way of connecting the natural and the supernatural and also these various threads of our lives, I think is particular to uh, the way that Lewis looks at the world and the, the way that he's inviting us uh, to encounter out of the sun and planet. I had a priest that once had mentioned, don't think of your faith as like, a, a, a cookie with a bunch of chocolate chunks in and you try to fit as many spiritual practices, those chocolate chunks in, but it's like the yeast that, that makes everything mm. rise. Oh, that's um, beautiful. I love that. Yeah. Cause I'm, I'm the one that's like compartmental. Okay. I've got to do this, this, let me squeeze this. And maybe I can add this spiritual practice to my life and just constantly trying to layer more and more in. And I feel like I'm doing better if I layer more in and it's like, well, you know, is, is it really permeating everything though? I mean, it's not a bad thing necessarily to layer those things in. They can maybe help with the permeation part of it, but the ultimate goal is it's just part of everything you do, the way you think, the way you act, the way you operate. Well, I think that that's- I love yeah. it. And that's, I think, one of the gifts that the medieval period and the, and the writers therein you know, uh, have to offer us is this kind of cohesiveness and unity. And I was just reflecting as you all were talking, half of Western civilization from the time of the Bible and the Aeneid, from Virgil and Christ till now, one half of everything that we've done has been in the medieval period, and we disregard it to our great, uh, our, our great disparagement. Um, it gave me the inspiration for a talk I'd love to give sometime. You can see how medieval has become a real pejorative and means benighted. But um, you know, somebody will say, "Oh, well, that's positively medieval." Yes. So now I want to write a talk about Lewis's medieval worldview called "Positively Medieval." You know, and <laughs> and look at the ways that you know all of that um the, all of that stuff in that thousand years uh, of time there's still real depths of that to plumb to us and a lot of our ignatian spirituality a lot of you know the benedictine stuff a lot of the stuff that are important to christians um trying to practice historical christianity was developed cuz the medieval period starts with the fall of rome and kind of comes hard on the heels of the baptisms, you know, of of Constantine. It's around 500, and I think that you're so wise to mention Arthur, who lives around 500, and the legends start around there. And so I think that those thousand years or so have a great deal to offer us, and not just wishful thinking and Renaissance fairs, which I like. <laughs> I like both wishful thinking and Renaissance fairs. And turkey legs, giant turkey legs. <laughs> absolutely, absolutely, and over-dramatized uh, Shakespeare. But, but I think that Lewis does invite us into that period. You know, he he uh, on the genesis of a medieval book and uh, his discarded image and these and his invitation to read a very old book after reading a very new book. And what he means is something from, you know, perhaps that period or earlier. 
You mentioned The Discarded Image, which is uh, one of those underrated Lewis books. Everyone should read it. And for those who have read Out of the Silent Planet a number of times, a lot can be gained by reading A Discarded Image alongside of uh, Out of the Silent Planet. And for those who are looking for that extra little bit of challenge, uh, I would challenge you to take a look at that. Before we wrap this up... um... Diane, I'd love, uh, is there any anything either from the book or Out of the Silent Planet or your book that's uh, maybe we miss that you think could be valuable? Uh, no pressure, by the way. <laughs> so you don't have to are... come up with anything here, but create some space. Sometimes when you're putting that in an interview, you don't realize the person on the other side is like, well, this would have been a great thing to ask. <laughs> <laughs> and many of our folks are starting to read Out of the Silent Planet for the first time or the first time seriously. And yeah, I think that Matt's wise in asking you to guide us better. Well, I would I would just make an observation to underscore something that we've talked about and that I'm delighted we've spent some significant time on, and that's opening our hearts to love, to experience mm-hmm. story, uh, not just to read it, but to really enter into it. Lewis's language can be a little bit dense as we get started. It's not the swift forward-moving, action-packed storytelling that we might be used to. That if we relax, we listen to the language and the poetry of it, we open ourselves to the possibilities of feeling and not just noticing. I think that those Mm. are important things. That's what struck me when I read it the first time when I was in high school. I had been reading a lot of science fiction. I picked this up, not sure what to expect, and I allowed myself to fall inside Uh, Uh That meant sometimes reading very slowly, sometimes rereading the same passage, sometimes reading Mm -hmm. a a passage or two out loud, just to feel the taste of the words in my mouth. And I think that Out of the Silent Planet is a little book. It's a tiny little book, and it's so packed with so much wisdom uh, and so much uh, just just real goodness. Mm -hmm. And I hope that readers Mm -hmm. will um, really access that in every way possible. You said feeling and not just noticing. And that's so important. And of course, it brings to mind Lewis's ideas of the enjoyed as well as the contemplated. And in another kind of little known, relatively thin, very important book, Experimenting Criticism, Mm -hmm. right? A book needs to be received more than it is used, right? Mm. Let the book be what it is in in and of itself. And, and take that all in. Matt, I, you know, it's, I'm sure it's going to tumble up David's whole schedule, but he'll just have to deal with it. I think we should probably invite Diana back at least maybe a year from now as we wrap up and hear her perspective. And uh, I think that if we could, you know, connive her into coming on again, you know, send her some good <laughs> swag and, and see if she's got an hour next November. But I would, I would love to hear uh, more from you, Diana, as we wrap up a year from now. Thank you, friends. I love it. And, and yes, Dr. Diana Glider, thank you so much for coming on. Uh, and where can listeners learn more about you, particularly ones that this is the first time hearing you? Maybe they've come across the podcast uh, since the last time and get access to any of your resources, material, and most importantly, this book. So let me let me make a couple of notes. First of all, I appreciate uh, the accolades, but I want to make sure that read, that listeners are clear that I am the editor, not the author of A Compass to Deep Heaven, and I'm actually the co-editor with the very talented uh, Julianne Johnson. Uh, the students who began this project worked for. Uh, a full year to write it and then worked two years beyond that to continue researching and refining their writing skills and digging deep into it. And I'm really proud of the book that they've produced. Uh, The uh, other thing that I'd like readers to know is that all of the proceeds from the sale of A Compass for Deep Heaven goes to create a fund that will award senior students in the Honors College at APU. Um, It's an award for the best senior essay. And so the students who produced A Compass for Deep Heaven wanted to pay it forward. And so rather than taking any proceeds, they created what they call the Compass Award 
oh, for the best senior that. writer. And we give them an engraved compass as well as a cash prize in mm. order to encourage young writers. And so even if you're just going to buy a copy to give away, uh, you're, you should know that in buying a compass for Deep Heaven, you're supporting student scholarship. And I think that that's a pretty big deal. And you can uh, buy it wherever you buy books. Amazon has it. Barnes & Noble has it. Your uh, local independent bookseller can get it quite easily from Square Halo Books. And if people want to know a little bit about me or find links to some of the talks that I've given, some of the topics that I like to talk about, they can visit my website at dianaglier.com. My introvert friends are horrible self-promoters. My wife is the <laughs> same way. Um, her talk in 2014 about intellectual hospitality has ac absolutely shaken the world and not just the Lewis world. That's available on YouTube from the C.S. Lewis Foundation. Um, and as I always do, anytime Diana's name comes up, I offer listeners a money-back guarantee for both <laughs> um, um, the company they keep, C.S. Lewis and J.R.R. Tolkien, as writers in community, and uh, it's kind of it's kind of follow up applicational uh, edition of that, um, which expands in some ways those ideas. A book called Bandersnatch, and literally, if you buy either or both of those books and you read them and you find them of no use to you, I will absolutely pay you for shipping and everything else. These are two of the most important contributions to inkling studies and also mm -hmm. to the kind of lo ultimate loving intellectual act, the act of collaboration. And, um, and those books speak m much past the field of humanities um, and offer us ways to love each other while producing good work. And I can't enthuse enough about them. I don't get a cut. <laughs> and we'll put a link in the show notes. That was actually Bandersnatch was the first time we had uh, Diana on the show. And I had the privilege of uh, interviewing her for that. And so that is definitely an episode if you are new to go back to and listen to. Well, beautiful. Well, before the sign off, I'd like to thank our listeners, our Patreon supporters, our top tier ones, Matt, Jake, James, Erica, Marvin, Joelle, Deborah, Amanda, Thomas, Bill, Bud, Shane, Kay, Paul, Kimberly, Gillis, Gary, Stephen, Matt, Kelly, Chris, James, Kate, Peter, David, Angela, and Rowdy. That list is getting longer and longer. And we pray for all of our listeners in all the prayer requests in our Slack channel that we get every single Tuesday. Uh, if you enjoyed this episode, go check us out on social media and please join us next time when we'll go further up and further in. Cheers. 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 <laughs>